Hang tight, guys. Hang tight. Sometimes you gotta love technology. It causes a little delay, but we are all coming in. Send everybody another quick email, let them know we're in. If anybody wants to ask any questions, if you're in and logged in and have any questions, clarity around anything we've covered, this would be a great time to open up your mic and go for it. All right, where's my email that I just opened up? Okay, we've got people coming in. All right, guys, we're going to get started. Anybody have any questions about anything we've covered? I mean, we're, we're working on the how-tos now, specific scripts, things that you can use, stuff like that. And, and just the thing that I want you to think about as you're getting ready to unmute and ask a question, if you have one, or clarity around anything, is just remember on this material. I mean, the way we've designed this is to make it so you can plug into this every single week. It's a one hour commitment. You are committed. I mean, for 18 weeks of, of like really working on your business and really taking your business to the next level and taking a jump ahead towards mastery and, and learning the things that you can use out there in the field. Um, and one of the things I just wanna remind you of is that we're not going to master this material in one hour it would and it wouldn't matter if it were four hours or if it were an all-day session you're still not going to master that much material it's just so much coming at you so here's my suggestion here's my coaching tip for today that today we're talking about negotiations right so the next time you're writing an offer you know you're going to be writing an offer the people say they're interested in a house we're going to probably write an offer or you're writing an offer up the next you know, hour that you can go to the past recordings, pull up negotiations for contracts and watch the video again, because we're going to have specific scripts in here that will sound cool and they're awesome while you're in class today. However, we also want you to be able to use them to help you get the offer accepted and get more offers accepted and not miss out on so many things. So whether it's working with a buyer, working with a seller, all that stuff, just pull up that session and watch it again while you're in the middle of the situation. And then you're going to pick these two or three scripts up and go, oh, I'm going to use that one today. So that's the way that you're going to master this stuff. And like like I've just kind of talked about over and over again, is just committing to Ignite for the next 12 months and really bring it into your business. Because then you can bring real world situations that every time we get to that section and now you're dealing with it, you'll have a situation that came up and you can get some ideas on how to handle that. And it's not necessarily just my ideas. I mean, my ideas are just mine that, you know, with, with 100 sales a year, what we've done over those 2,500 transactions over the last 30 years and tweaked and tweaked and tweaked to where I get to the script that I use. So I just share with you that real world stuff. But um, so does anybody have any questions or clarity on anything that we've covered in the past? And also just... Even somebody say, we can hear you. We see you and hear you. That would be good too. <laughs> you guys there, you can hear me, right? We can hear you. All yeah, right. we can hear you. All right, cool. Yeah, we can hear you. I got a lot of monitors off, so I just want to make sure you guys were still there. And I know like these classes with the Zooms and, and a lot of times when I'm coaching too, it's more of a phone call because you are... I mean, I'm assuming that you guys are busy writing stuff as I'm rolling through things. You know, I talk fast. I cover a lot of information and you write down as much as you can. And when you're writing that stuff down man, highlight it or something, if you didn't get it all, 
shoot me an email, shoot, call me. I don't care. Oh, speaking of that calling and, and all that, I want to put um, in the chat box, my email and my cell phone that you guys can say, Hey, can you share that script again? Um, I didn't quite catch it all. Uh, let me see here. There we go. We're on share. Now I should be able to find my chat. All right. That you guys can contact me anytime that you want clarity on something, or if you're even in a situation in a contract and you don't have anybody available to ask, you can also call me. I don't know your state laws and things like that, so I may not be able to help on that side of it, but um, definitely if it's like negotiating or some of the stuff that we talk about today, I definitely can. All right. Now you have my cell phone and my email. Um, and in fact, uh, you should be able to find me if you just Google me. You'll find my address. It's on College Boulevard is my office address and Apache Drive is my home address. If you guys want to add me as one of your five people today, put me on whatever these plans are that you're putting in place to feed your database every day. Write me a handwritten note. Show me that you've got the plan going and you're working on it, right? So if you're not working on your database and going through your Facebook friends list and your cell phone list and putting those on a master list notebook, and then taking the time to just research a little bit, like look on Facebook, you got basically Facebook, Google, fastpeoplesearch.com, between those three and tax records, MLS and tax records, you should be able to find an address for over 70 to 80% of the people that are on your list between those four resources. So just think, just really focus on feeding your database every day. That's the best way you're going to learn command or whatever database you're using. And then writing that note and starting that eight by eight plan to uh, get your branding in front of us. I mean, you guys want to keep your branding in front of me, right? So put me in your database. That's how you're going to get that business and get that referral. And you guys can do that with everybody locally there too. Just getting around in the area, we already have heard how just an hour away you guys can network with each other and become top of mind to share. So for example, real quick on that note, my license is held at a Kansas office at the Keller Williams Overland Park office. It's one of the largest offices in the company, I think towards the top end. And uh, the profit sharing is huge there too, because we have over 580 agents. We might even be at 600 now. But it's in Kansas and I work on the Missouri side mostly. I mean, that's 95% of my business. So I market to the Kansas agents for their Missouri business because it's about a 45 minute drive for them. Price range is a lot lower. So they don't like to work these over here. I mean, not a lot lower. It's probably 30, 40, $50,000 less for the average price point. So I'll take those all day long because I've got systems in place to make them just process through that they don't take me more time, takes the same amount of time. So I just close more of them because I've got systems to run the business. So they know they can entrust me and I'm an agent in the office. So I'm not even competing with them on the Missouri stuff, really. They can just collect the referral fee. Again, referral fees, remember, like even just for example, a 25% referral fee is all the profit in the transaction is pure profit in commission. That comes off the top. So anything left after you pay a referral fee, you have to cover your costs, pay your team, do your offices, all that stuff. And then hopefully you have a little bit of profit left in there. You know, according to the MREA, Millionaire Real Estate Agent book, you're going to have six at, at an operating at a high efficiency level. You're operating with 60 percent expenses and 40 percent profit. So if you pay a 25 percent referral fee you're leaving 15% profit. You also shouldn't have to work as hard and have had to keep in touch with that person as long as you do to get those your normal deals turned into a deal, right? Because if the average person's moving every 10 years, somebody else kept in touch with them and captured the lead and gave it to you and that's what you're paying for. So anyway, just keep all that stuff in mind that uh, you know referrals are not a bad business model uh, because you're getting all pure profit and you have no time or money really invested in other than top of mind for that relationship to know to contact you when they're ready to buy and sell. So hopefully that's a little helpful. Oh, did I not? Yeah, I got my cell phone and email. All right, so let's jump into this material. 
remember, just go back and pull these videos up. If you guys are working with a buyer or working with a seller, you're, you're about to negotiate a contract, just pull this section up. Watch the video again whenever you can and go pull your notes out on it. Keep it very organized in tabs, right? So today we're basically talking about negotiating, uh, negotiating contracts. And one thing I will tell you, this is, this is a huge value proposition for you. You can use this in your listing appointment. I use it in my listing appointment. I say negotiation skills are not taught in real estate school. There's a couple of things I say at a listing appointment, if you want to write this down, that these can become value propositions for you, that it's maybe not so much that your competition can't say it. I know the competition isn't saying it. But what you can say is, you know, the one thing to understand about real estate agents is when we go to real estate school, what actually let me open up any mics. You guys tell me, what you did you learn what you needed to know in real estate school? No, Maybe not at all. No. 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 So real estate is marketing and negotiating are two major, major things. And then the third one that I talk about is reputation. So these are three little value propositions you can use in your favor right now by saying, you know, in real estate school, let me tell you, they didn't teach us anything we needed to know. In fact, they, the word marketing doesn't even come up in real estate school. It doesn't. They didn't talk about how to market a product. And so I talk from a business perspective. I say, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, we're marketing your product. We're trying to get your product, your house picked over all the other houses that are on the market, right? That requires marketing. I mean, a simple example is look at Oreo cookies, right? Do Oreo cookies cost more than the no-name brand, like the Best Choice or the Hydrox cookies? They do cost more, right? And they do better branding and they do better packaging and they do better positioning to get picked and people pay more for the cookie, right? So that's what we do is marketing. And they don't teach marketing in real estate school. They teach us how to pass the test. Second thing they don't teach, negotiation skills, right? That's what we're doing today, guys. Negotiation skills. Negotiating a house, you know, we don't negotiate a couple hundred bucks here and a couple hundred bucks there. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, in this market, we negotiate five and $10,000 at a time. So picking your agent is critical that you pick somebody that knows how to negotiate and work with people. And then the third thing I say is reputation. And I say a lot of people, you can't even interview for reputation. What I can tell you is agents in my marketplace love working with me. So again, guys, look at this. You've got some benefits here that you can market to the co-op agents that you're working with. Write them a handwritten note when they make you an offer. Tell them how great it was that we got to cross paths and hope to cross paths with them again. Um, when, you go to, when you go to a show a house, provide the feedback, right? Because you know you want feedback when you have a listing. So send feedback to those listing agents every single time right away. And then just send them a message and go, hey, I want to make sure you got my feedback. That's like building rapport with the agents in your marketplace. I'm not talking about just KW agents. I'm talking about your competition, right? Because then the side benefit is as you build those relationships with your local agents, it makes your job easier for your clients to get their offers accepted. It also gives you the opportunity for profit sharing on the backside that if they ever just, man, you, you know, say anything about it, just love working with you. It's like, oh man, I, I love working with you too. And wouldn't it be great if you, you know, I don't know if you're happy where you are at your current company, but man, what if uh, you just checked out Keller Williams? This is what they taught me to do and build my business this way. You'd, you'd be a great fit. I don't know if it's right for you or not. You just have to talk to my team leader and, and find out if it's an option for you. But, you know, anyway, it starts the conversation. So anyway, just know all this stuff. I'm kind of giving you a lot of stuff, but I'm just layering in why you're doing a lot of these things and how they translate across your whole business. Okay. And feel free to jump in or raise your hand, guys. Your hand will pop up on the screen and then I'll kind of take a breath so you can unmute yourself and jump in. Um, so any questions so far? How many of you just got a little more excited about your local agents and your business and your profit sharing? Just that little tidbit right there might get you a little more excited, right? Just opening your mind to the ideas and everything that you've got here. Okay, so breakdown on the three P's. Talking about, let me get over here. It's slowing down here. 
the three P's. So consider on your buyers when, when you have the ability to uh, negotiate and affect the outcome of the deal. What are some of the ways that you negotiate everyday life? What are some of the skills that a great negotiator has? And what is asking great questions have to do with negotiating? So the first thing on this, seeking to discover common ground to get both parties to an agreement. Guys, always understand that it's a buyer that wants to buy this house and it's a seller that wants to sell this house. It has nothing to do with me or you or how experienced we are or if you're a top agent or not a top agent, it has nothing to do with us. What we have to do is find that common ground for buyers and sellers to buy the property and sell their property. So we have to have conversations with them to give them as much information as we can so they can make the right choice for them. So when you're negotiating a contract, you're going to see some stuff here where sellers can just snap back, you know, offer comes in low, has closing costs, and they want them to leave all their appliances. We're going to talk a little bit more about these in detail. But like something like that comes back and the, the seller just says, oh, I'm not doing that. It's to have a conversation around that. OK, so what do you mean by not doing that? What, what about this offer? Well, all of it. OK, so if you don't sell your house right now to this buyer, even though they might be willing to take some of this stuff out, are you saying you don't even want to try to sell your house to them? Well, no, that's not what I'm saying. OK, so I'm asking questions. I'm here to to facilitate to get them both to get the buyer to buy it and the seller to sell it. And I don't know where that middle ground is going to be, but that's what we're talking about today is finding out the information so that you can ask better questions rather than, you know, their, their agent was a jerk when they sent it over. They were really short with me. They said the house was overpriced and, you know, they sent this offer because the agent was just telling them it was overpriced. And, you know, I agree with you. I wouldn't sell it for that either. I think it's worth more. That you should not have any of those kind of conversations. You can't sell a property that way. So it's about asking them questions. It doesn't matter what you think, whether you think that's a high price or the low price. It doesn't matter if you think they should include the appliances, shouldn't include the appliances. It is not your sale and it is not your equity at the end of the day. What you have to show them is based on these terms, here's the check you're going to walk away with at the end of the day. And I write this down, guys, always have a net sheet with you on every single offer. Um, I uploaded just a sample net sheet that I use. And, and it's, it's a sample because I don't know what your closing costs are and things like that. But I just put the basic standard fees in there in an Excel spreadsheet that prints out and kind of looks like a net sheet that they get at closing. And it's an estimate. But I can plug in the purchase price and I can plug in if the buyer's asking for closing costs. I always put in there if there's a warranty plan or not, you know, the commissions, the whole thing. So if I'm working with the seller, I can say, rather than say, would you sell your house for this house? And they'd say no. And I'd say, but if you walked away with a check for 250,000, would you be happy? And they'll say, well, yeah, we'd love to get 250. Okay, well, the price doesn't mean anything. You're not giving your house away. The price is a made up number that some we all pulled out of the air. The price is only worth what the buyers are willing to write offers on. We got an example coming up and I'll share that with you. But what I say is I, I don't go through price and all that stuff. I just say, tell me what amount the check would need to be for a seller. Tell me the amount of the check at the end of the day would need to be that you would be happy if you sold your house. Now, if they say 350,000, right? And they have a hundred thousand dollar loan. So they would net 250, simple terms, right? And they say, well, 350. And I said, no, I don't know if I explained that properly. I'm talking about after the loans paid off, all your closing costs. We're talking taxes, commission. I layer in the middle somewhere just so we don't have to have the discussion around. It's not being tricky. It's just not putting it at the end where you're leaving it on commission. So now we have to have, well, let's talk about commission. So I say taxes, commission, the title company, they charge you fees to put all the paperwork together. Um, there's recording fees, all that stuff's in there. So after everything, you get a check at the end of the day. What does that amount need to be? So this is a way to negotiate for the right purchase or the right price to go on the market at, right? We're talking about negotiating contracts, but here's just a little bonus. So when I get that, and well, I mean, we really haven't thought of that number. So you might have to guide them through it. Well, what are you guys doing with the equity? Well, we're putting down at least 20% on the next house and we wanted to pay off a car and do something else. Great. What's those amounts need to be? 
Uh, about 190,000. Great. So if you got 190,000 and could do that, that would be, that'd be a good day. Well, I mean, we don't want to give the house away, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So we'll pull the net sheet out and I go, this net sheet shows at, at 300,000, you would net 250 or for example, 350, you'd net 250 if you had a hundred thousand dollar loan. Right. So if you got a check for two, oh, well, that'd be great if we got 250. Okay. Well, this is the price we can start at. We don't, the market's probably showing a little bit less than that. So I might do a price change. Or if you're coming in lower to get the multiple offer bids, you can just talk about that net. So at this lowest net that we got, if you guys did get that, could you live with that? Yes. Now, if we compete, if we create competing bids over this price, you might get that or better. But we know that's the bottom dollar. So I always talk in terms of net with my sellers. So anyway, when you're talking about these buyers and sellers and you're bringing them all together, remember the agents are facilitating the buyer and seller just want to buy and sell their property. So you've got to get them out of their emotional state or their reactive state, and you are facilitating to put it together. Whatever that common ground will be, you're going to work and work and work and work until you get them as close as possible that they could both live with it. And then you're going to sell more properties. But like, a, like we said last time, a snap decision to reject an offer is going to get you no sale. I can absolutely guarantee you, you cannot sell a property if you reject the offer. It's just not, it's rejected. It's dead, right? So you have to just counter however you need to counter. And we'll be working through some of that stuff. Does anybody have any questions they want to jump in on? I just want to make sure I get you guys involved too. So your ability to negotiate can affect the outcome of the deal. That your ability, well, your way that you handle the transaction. And if the other agent, you got to understand that the other agents that you guys are working with in your marketplace may not be coming from a company that talks about win-win or no deal, right? For some reason, real estate agents have really big egos. And if you're dealing with a big agent with a big ego, especially at a competitor, I mean, it can happen in Keller Williams family too. But if you're talking with somebody that's not in our culture and they have a big ego, they will feel they need to win. They feel like it's, you know, chopping the head off and you have to become the massive facilitator there. Guys, I literally had a, had a time where an agent was... She was like one of the bigger agents uh, in the city. And she was calling me. I mean, every time she called, she just went into nasty mode instantly. Now, she sold even way more than me. She was like an icon agent way up at the top, had been around even longer than me. Now, this was probably 15, 20 years ago. So I was still fairly new to the Kansas City area and had been selling for a few years. But I, Here's one of my calls with her, her and I were talking and I finally said, you know what? I am so tired of arguing with you. All right. I mean, it seems like every time we get on the phone, it's some big fight that you want to have. Listen, your buyer wants to buy my listing and my seller wants to sell the listing to your buyer. Can we just cooperate and let's put this deal together? And it changed the rest of the transaction. In fact, I ended up getting the seller $40,000 more for something in our negotiations of repairs because they asked for more than what it really was. It was something ridiculous, but she just thought she could trample all over me. And I just said, hold on, well, let's stop right here for a second. You know, when we co-op, that's what you call it in the MLS system and in real estate, Co-op means cooperate. Can we work together to see if we can get the seller and buyer to agree? And let's remove like our, our hardcore negotiating here. Let's see if we can get them both to come to a common ground. And that's what you guys are doing, right? So you're going to be negotiating during the offer and the option. So you negotiate a couple different times. Also, if you go back and look at the sessions from the buyer session and the seller session, we talked about removing the hat. So even though I might be representing a seller, if I've gone back to a counter offer to the buyer and they've countered back to us again, if that did happen, I got to take my seller representation hat off and put on my seller wants to sell their house property and start having a discussion around this counter offer might be the best thing that we've got. So you need to consider that and ask questions around it versus 
They didn't take your counter offer. They countered. Let's counter back in the middle and go back and forth. All you're doing is wasting time. You guys are going to hear me say a little bit later, we don't go back and forth more than once, maybe twice at the tops in my world, because every time that goes back and forth and every time I have to get on the phone, it's an, an inefficient business model. It is not predictable. Some things take longer than others. So what you do is you use all the scripts and things that we share to shortcut the process. And it's one, one offer negotiation back and we want them to take it. And so when I come back with the seller on our, on our first counter offer, I got to take off the hat, put on my hat that I'm a partner with the other agent and their buyer. And I've got to convince them this is the best deal that they're going to, that they're, they're getting the best deal possible on this property. Like this is a steal of a deal. I've got to convince them of that. So that they'll just take the counter and we're done rather than just sending it over by fax and let's see what happens. Right. So you can't negotiate anything if just faxing things back and forth. Now, if you've done that in the past and it's working, that's fine. If you, I will tell you that for the most part, if you want to get to the point where you're closing five, eight, 10 transactions a month or more, you've got to have efficiencies in place because you can't manage 10 contracts a month when every one of them take an extra hour or two longer to run people around to more properties or to go back and forth on negotiations. You got to streamline this down, make all the sales still happen, get to those, those negotiating skills, help you get to that finish line faster. Uh, so your ability to negotiate the outcome. Uh, I know one of the questions they ask in the book is how do you negotiate some of your stuff in real life? And that, just bring it home and listen to, if you have kids, listen to your conversations with your kids and how they negotiate to get things done, right? Um, my grandson was just here yesterday and he wanted to stay at Popcorn's house. He calls me Popcorn. I'm grandpa and I'm Popcorn. So he calls me Popcorn. He wants to stay at Popcorn's house, but mom's got to go home because she's got to work and dad's coming home at 2.30, right? And so he starts kind of negotiating. She's negotiating with him on so... You know, if you stay here, you've got to take a nap, you know, but if we go home, you could take a nap at home. And he's like, OK, so can we watch a movie while I'm taking a nap at home? Yeah, we can watch a movie. So she's just making him feel like, OK, she's getting him to leave the house. And now he's got his stuff lined up. He's going to actually take a nap, watch the movie. And he's good. Now he's not getting all upset. So we negotiate all the time. Your job is to negotiate to come to a common ground because what doesn't typically work is just tell them, go do it or you got to move out. You know, when we had leads that would come into our team, our team, our buyer's agents, I said, if they didn't get them in the database, return the call within 30 seconds, get them in the database and write the note, then we just have to shut you off of the leads. Well, pretty soon within a week, nobody's getting any leads because nobody's doing what they need to do. So that doesn't work. You got to negotiate. What can you do of this process? You follow the process. I'll show you how to sell 100 homes a year. If you're not going to follow the process, what step can you do that you will commit to every single time? That could have been just getting the lead in the database. So you, you negotiate all the time. Um, all right. And asking questions, asking questions, asking questions. So write down, uh, let's see. Nope, that's it. That's it on that. All right. Let me see if I'm following my slides. Any questions or anybody need any clarity on anything? All right. There is uh, one thing I want you guys to think about is... Um, possible answers i want you guys to think while we're going through class what are what are some possible questions and answers and negotiations that you guys have used or you think you would use regarding price moving date repairs closing costs furniture and household items etc those are kind of the things that we typically negotiate over so if somebody says they want furniture or somebody says they want repairs, how are you guys handling those negotiations? So just think about that. So it either comes down to price or terms are typically your two categories that you're in. Now, um, let's see if I have this. Oh, there we go. Just stay right here. Price and terms. So a couple of things I made notes here. 
explain that the sale price is the primary factor for negotiations, but it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily about your client's bottom line. There could be other stuff in there like closing costs and things like that. So let me just go through a couple of them that may be financial, time-based, both, whatever. One of them is closing costs, for example. So closing costs and commissions kind of rolls into this too when you're negotiating your commission at the listing agreement, if you have to do that. I don't feel like I ever negotiate my commission. It's on the net sheet. I have the net sheet with me at the listing appointment. And I talk about what do you guys want to net at the end of the day before I ever pull the, the commission sheet or the, the estimated closing statement out on the price I think we should go on the market for, all their closing costs, and then the commissions in there and everything. Um, and I say, what do you guys need to actually net? And when they say 350, I mean, after your loan's paid off and after all your costs, well, if we got 200, we'd be happy. Great, now I can pull the net sheet out and it doesn't matter what my commission is at this point, if that net sheet shows 200 or higher, probably gonna get the commission. When you're dealing with offers, you need to show them the net, right? When 30 offers come in on a property, all I have to do is plug the, the price and the terms. Terms meaning like you can't put furniture on a net sheet. The closing date will affect the taxes that are prorated, but the closing date and the furniture and things like that are factors in the offer. But for me to determine of these 30 offers that came in, I could just run a net sheet on them and look at the net on all 30, and I'm going to be able to eliminate 20 or 25 of them easy. Now, if one of those at the lower end have something with super flexible on closing date and didn't ask for any furniture and didn't ask for any closing costs, and some of the other offers ask for all that stuff, I might leave that one in there just to show them that the super clean offer still only came in at this price and the net is 10,000 less than the one that's asking for closing costs. So when closing costs comes up, almost always a seller jumps to a reaction. You guys tell me if you've had this, right? Where they say, well, I'm not paying their closing costs. Have you guys had that? If you've written any offers, I'm not gonna pay their closing costs. They pay their own closing costs. In fact, most of the time, keeping in mind that most people move every 10 years, do you know that they don't even know they have closing costs? They don't even realize as a seller, they're supposed to pay closing costs. So you have to explain, oh yeah, no, I mean, it's not, you're not paying for their closing costs, right? So if they offer 350,000 for a house, right? And they ask for $5,000 in closing costs or 10, just say 5,000 in closing costs, what I explained to the seller is in essence, they have offered you 345 for the house. You're really not writing a check and paying for their closing costs. Now I know for many of you who have not written an offer yet, this is a great script, right? Re remember this one, it's going to come up a lot. So really they're offering you 345 for the house. They have just rolled in $5,000 in closing costs. Now, see, that's me representing the seller. I'm still going to explain it to my seller that way. I said, but here's the important question is, what do you want to net at the end of the day? So after all the costs, no matter whether you pay their closing costs or not, see, they haven't decided yet or not, but I'm having a conversation. Just forget about that for a second. What do you want to net at the end of the day? Well, we want to, like we said, we want to net 250000 Okay, great. Let's just proceed through the contract and we'll go through the net sheet line by line and this will be as the offer was received. So by the time we get through with the closing costs, let's just say they're netting 253. So now I get to save the whole conversation around them paying their closing costs. This offer will net you 253. Now, if it nets them 240, okay, if it nets them 240, that's a different story. If they would rather keep the house than sell it for less than 250, that is their decision. I just need to make sure that that is the bottom dollar. Because a lot of times they would come back and say, well, we would, you know, we would not take any less than 235 and we could be sitting at 240, but we're, and we're not going to give the house away. Okay. Well, this offer, the way it sits is netting you 240. If you sign it, we're done. If you don't, we're not making sure you guys can hear me. Okay. Right. A call's coming in from somewhere and I didn't want to make sure it wasn't you guys calling going, we can't hear you. All right. Closing date is another one that we're going to talk about asking great questions between the co-op too. It's not you against them. It's asking great questions to help their buyer and your seller come to an agreement 
whatever that agreement may be, you're going to sell to each side that it's the best deal they could possibly get. So closing date, when you're asking the agents on closing date and things like that, I mean, whenever an offer comes in, I will always say to a co-op agent, what's the most important thing about this offer that I need to try and keep in here for your client? What is the most important thing about this offer that I need to try and keep in here for your client? Because then you get to find out if it is price, well, they're just really concerned about the price. You know, they're out of their comfort zone, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so price is the one thing that if we can't, if we don't change that, that would be the best for your buyer. Obviously, I'm not committing. I'm not saying that. And I will say, now I'm not saying the seller will take it. I just need to know how to best sell your offer. So that's the one important thing. Now, they may have closing costs in there and asking them to leave some grandfather clock or a piano, who knows what, which, by the way, pianos, I'd leave those all day long. If it's a regular piano, you cannot get rid of them unless it's a family heirloom. You cannot give those things away. I'm sure you guys experience the same thing. So anyway, um, but that's why you're asking questions. So what's the most important thing in this offer about your client that I can try and keep in here for you? You got conveyances, earnest money. Okay, like I already said, most of the time, um, most of the, I hear the script I say on earnest money, because we just had this come up from Scott last week about they wrote a $20,000, I think it was a $10,000 money check and the seller wanted 35 and they came back with 20. The script to even save that back and forth, because that right there ate up a lot of time. You know, going back and forth and doing all this stuff. And then you got to explain to the other party. And so a great script on that is, so comes in at 10,000, seller says we want 35,000. I will be looking at a net sheet saying, now the earnest money has nothing to do with this bottom line, getting the check sold, right? And I will tell you that 95 to 98, well, really 99% of the time, the earnest money is protected in the loopholes of inspections. The only time this would not work is if the mo earnest money, somebody's writing it non-refundable, right? And if it's non-refundable earnest money, I almost don't care what that amount is because the buyer's not getting it back no matter what. And they're gonna get that no matter what, right? If it's non-refundable, all contingencies are removed, different story. But if it's just earnest money, I will say 99.9% .9 of the time, earnest money is not even kept by the other party because they're going to think that no matter what happens when this offer falls apart, they get the earnest money. So I'm saving that conversation by having it now saying in, in 30 years, 2,500 sales, we've only kept earnest money one time and we had to go to court to get it, right? So you have to get a judge. Both parties have to agree who the earnest money is going to. And if they don't, it's got to go to court. So just understand that earnest money is not affecting your bottom line. It's not really affecting other, anything other than if they would default or not. That, that's really explaining what earnest money really is, right? So, and we had, as said, the, the response last week was, I mean, do you think they would walk away from $10,000, but not walk away from $35,000? I'm just trying to understand uh, why the earnest money is the one item holding this up. Because if you really believe they would not walk away from $30,000, $35,000, but they would from ten, dollars then I can understand why they want more earnest money. So if they came back at twenty. dollars I would say, so now 20 versus 35,000 guys, you really think that's the difference, whether they'll just default and walk away and not show up at closing and the extra 15,000 will. And most people are gonna say, no, I mean, we only get it. We only get it if they default on the contract and don't show up for closing. They've got their inspection contingencies. They've got all this other stuff. They're getting that money back no matter what. And once they get past all of those, now, if they don't perform, that's when they lose their earnest money. So now what we could also do, if you know this isn't like, if it was 10,000, went back to 35, came back at 20, in that particular case, I would say, would it make you feel better if we get all their contingencies out of the way in the next seven days? We got them to 20. Uh, I mean, obviously, if they would have done 35, they would have come back and offered 35. That's what you asked for. So there's a reason why they're at 20. I would have tried to find that out so I can explain to my seller. But now I'll kind of look at everything. How do I keep this together and just, you know, facilitate the transaction? So I might say, 
What if we can get all their inspections and period, all that stuff done and all their loopholes are over in seven days? Well, okay, that would make sense. See, they just didn't want to drag out 30 or 45 days and then have to put the house back on the market. Second thing is our market, we have backup offers. So we can keep marketing the property for backup offers. So the big thing here is when it comes down to closing or when it comes down to price, closing date, contingencies or, or um, not contingencies, conveyances, earnest money, all that stuff. Always remember to try and figure out what's important and counter as few things as possible. If anything, if they've got closing costs in there and the seller just absolutely will not pay it and they're netting that much less than they really want, just counter the price, right? But you don't want to counter the price and then we really want the closing date here and we're not willing to leave the couch and we're not willing to do this. You know, when it comes to the couch or, or grandfather clock, I say, how much, how much would you sell that for that it'd be worth leaving, right? If it's a family heirloom, then we've got to negotiate that out, right? But if it's not, they're just not going to leave it or a pool table or something like that. It's like, well, we could probably sell that thing for $1,000. Okay, well, why don't we just change our price, get the closing cost and the pool table and everything figured in and let's just counter the price, leave the pool table. Then you don't have to try and sell it, right? And the closing cost will roll it into the price of the property and the buyer will be paying $2 per thousand, $3 per thousand. That will only change their payment about three bucks a month. It's about three or four dollars, two to four dollars a month, depending on the interest rate they're getting, right? Per thousand. So it's real easy to break that back down whenever you're bringing a counter offer back on a price. If you're countering $25,000, I mean, you can really say, hey, agent, this is really only going to change their payment about 50 bucks a month. I mean, it's not really a $25,000 counter offer. It's a $50 a month counter. That sounds way better. So just think of how you're negotiating and selling that as that is a pretty good deal to get this house for only $50 more a month. You guys see how that's all playing in there? Any questions or anything? All right. Uh, using negotiating tips to respond to common points, the three P's approach. Common points of negotiation. Oh, we already talked about this. Closing cost, closing day. Okay, I already gave you all that. It's prepare, present, and position. Um, I mean, anything when you're teaching a class, like the three P's and the this and the that are always good stuff. But really, you're preparing the offer. Whenever an offer comes in, I, I mentioned this when we were talking about the seller session. So if you need to go back and watch the seller session two sessions ago, I think it was elements number five, right? We talked about when I let a seller know that an offer is coming in and what is their avail availability today once I get all the details together. I could even still have the offer in hand for them to say, well, what's the offer? And I will say, I'm, I'm getting all that put together. I got to get all the details on it, the date, the terms, all that stuff. I need to get that into a net sheet for you. I still have to call and get your payoff on your loan. So we know we've got all the information we need to make sure we know what this offer really means to you, right? So that's the prepare part. The present part is where you're going to come in. I go in with the net sheet first. And I have that net sheet that's on the toolkit for you guys to use. All the links are in the emails that I send you guys. And if you're not getting emails, make sure they know you're on our roster list because I just go to the roster list and pull that off. You have links to all the past videos, documents, uh, workbooks, all that stuff. But in the present, I'm going to go get their payoff of their loan. I'm going to plug that into the net sheet. And it's going to be, a, I mean, that's going to be as close as I can get. And really, when I go to present, it's really about, so let me ask you guys again, if I wrote you a check right now and you were done with the sale of the property and you could move on, what's that amount need to be? Because now that's going to tell me how far off we are from the net of the actual offer and their net there. Even whatever number they give me here, it's still that may not be their bottom dollar. They say 250 and the offer sitting at 240. That comes in now and I show them, all right, here's the offer and I'll just go over the net sheet first and then we'll go through the offer and look at the terms because it doesn't have furniture on there. It doesn't really you know, show you the net sheet other than in ta or the closing date instead of taxes. So we still want to walk through the details of the offer, but I go to the net sheet first and I say, 
if you were to take this offer the way it was received, that's your net in 240. So while we're going through the offer there, you know, I'm, I've already got them thinking about, you know, if you, if I handed you a check for 240 and you were done today, would that be worth taking this offer? So by the time we go through the offer and the details, then we'll hear if there's closing date, closing cost, you know, any other conveyances that they have in the offer, we'll address those too. But then when we get to the end, based on all of that and their reaction, so what do you guys think? And it's like, well, we really did not want less than 245. I mean, really we wanted 250. So now I know we're gonna counter somewhere between 5,000 to $10,000. And if they netted that, can I talk them out of the conveyances and leave them to net that? You know, um, we got a couple examples come up that I'll run through uh, real quick for you. So that's where you just start helping them put the deal together. And then position, both parties, both parties have to agree. So anytime, this is another script, anytime anyone goes back with something different, just understand that means you've opened the door up to lose the contract. The seller to lose the buyer, they can just change their mind and walk. So if we were to ask for this $3,000 more you want, and they decided another house comes on the market, or they just change their mind and they walk and you don't get a second chance. Are you gonna be okay losing this buyer? I mean, I will have that conversation. I'm representing the seller, right? If they don't come back and they just change their mind and walk for whatever reason at all, are you okay not getting the house sold? Well, no, we don't really wanna lose them over $3,000. Okay, well then let's talk about that a little bit more. Because if we go back and counter, they could walk. I mean, that's always an option. And believe me, guys, I've had buyers walk on $1,000 because they thought about it. They changed their mind. Something better came on the market, whatever. If you're working with a buyer, no matter what you send back, if you're renegotiating during inspections, make sure your buyer knows. Now, I'm representing a buyer. And I say, now, if you guys are going to ask for these items, just understand that we are opening up the door that if another offer better than yours, any other offer shows up, especially if it's better or better terms or anything, the seller can just say no and cancel the contract. Now, I'm, there's legal parts here, so don't take that too general, but it's how I'm explaining it. They could change their mind, they could walk, they could go with another offer and you don't get this house. So I gotta ask again, are these that critical, right? One of them could be a new roof and it's total hail damage. So if they say yes, then at least when I send that counter offer back to negotiate those items, it's not gonna be my fault. I explained that if they walk or if they go with another offer and you don't get this house, are you okay with that? So what I did is I already pre-programmed that they're gonna be okay with it if it falls through. They won't be happy, but it's not gonna be my fault. Why didn't you tell us not to offer that? Why didn't you tell us to do this? You know, so those things protect you. Yeah, do I hear a mic open? They may want to add something or ask something. I got George. You might just have an open mic. Now am I mute you? Yep, I was going to say unmute yourself if you do have a question. All right, is this good stuff so far, guys? Okay, let me see here. What else we got? Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. Know your goal, know your client, think ahead, set expectations, be informed, obey the laws, right? So in, in those laws, uh, I forgot where I was going to go with that law thing. Um, I said, you just have to know, know your legal side of the contract. Those are your loopholes and your dates and everything and know the documents inside now. Guys, this is probably the most important thing that you want to glance over everything, but you also want to go back through it in detail and make sure you're covering everything. You are a problem solver. Think of yourself as a problem solver. You're here to keep this deal together. And I know in your book, it talks about, you know, immediate responses. There is very time sensitive situations. Do not ignore expiration dates on contracts. But if your seller is not going to respond in time, Make sure you're communicating back to the co-op agents. So, you know, I just had one the other day. It expired at five o'clock. He runs on the railroad and she sent it at 8.30 at night, the night before. There, he works the railroad. Um, and uh, 
that got some background noise there. He works the railroad. She works. They cannot communicate. They can't talk to each other. So um, I told the agent, I was like, I don't know that they're going to get together before five. And I, their schedules are so crazy. I'm not sure when they'll get together. She said, well, then we'll plan on 830. And I said, well, don't hold me to 830 either. I don't know, but I'm going to get back to you as soon as we can. George, do you have a question? I see you keep unmuting. All right, maybe you just keep button that. Your, your cursor might be on your little microphone. But if you want to jump in, I want to make sure I'm available for you. So I do tell them, listen, there's a lot of hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait. And we're waiting for information to go from you to me, to the agent, to their client, back to them, back to me, back to you. So it may seem like we're not getting a response right away. It doesn't mean things aren't happening. We don't know who's at work, where they are, if they're out of town, if they got a family emergency. So we do our best to hit these expiration dates, but they're not guaranteed. Now, if you're representing a buyer, just make sure you tell them. We'll put the expiration on here for 24 hours from now, but if they don't respond in time because you've got a co-op agent that's not very communicative, right, then just let them know if they don't respond, you just have the option to move on and buy something else. If you still want the house, you know, we may not get an answer in 24 hours, you know, so you just got to remind them of that through the thing. It's And don't get into... Oh, this agent's like a jerk. They're not responding. They're da -da. Don't involve them in any of that. You are a facilitator to help buyer and seller get their property sold no matter what's happening. And then you just explain the information is out there. I'm just confirming that we're coming up on our expiration time and I have not heard back. So you have the option. We can either just walk or if you guys still want it and they may be talking about it and be willing to accept it, you know, do we want to hang out and wait? I'll let the agent know, you know. Well, if they don't respond by 8 a.m. tomorrow, we're, we're moving on. Okay, great. Now I can relay that back to the agent and just say, hey, I'm not sure what's going on. So I had that exact same situation happen just a week ago. Buyer just flat out changed their mind and walked. And the agent's like, we had a verbal. They said they would do it, but the seller's out of town. And it's like, you hadn't responded back to let us know that. You just said that the seller was out of town. You didn't say they accepted the offer. So anyway, and it was all verbal. So anyway, um, okay, let's see here. So in your prepare session, we talked about asking open-ended questions, wopens, what, when, why, where. Those are all great questions that you want to ask. I know like your, do you have a specific date, right? Or do you have any other offers? A better way to ask, do you have any other offers is say, how many other offers do you have? Wopen, W-H-O-P-E-N. How many other offers do you have? I have none. Okay, that, that helps. But it's better than, do you have any other offers? Yes. Yes, what? Yes, how many? You would expect them to tell you. But if you ask, how many offers do you have? They'll say, we have three. So that actually saved me from going to show a property that I thought was a little overpriced. The guy's buying it as investment for rental property. He would be paying probably top end of the market. And I mean, it, it was in decent shape, but it wasn't completely updated. And he wanted to go see it. And I asked the agent, how many offers do you have? He said, we have three offers in right now. We're going to close them out on Monday afternoon. So I just sent that back to the buyer and said, hey, there's three other offers. He said, oh, yeah, this is for investment. Um, I, you know, I don't need to go get into a bidding war on this one because I knew he wouldn't. And it just saved me from having to show a house on Sunday afternoon. You know what I did instead? It's over at the lake, right? So, but what I mean is, you know, I would have gone out and showed him the house anyway, but there was no reason to show him if he wasn't willing to get into multiple offers or multiple situations. All right, so what would happen if, and this is just the learning side. Why is that important to you? That's the best question. Why is that important to you? And the what, what would happen if is, you know, if we counter and you don't get this house, you know, are you going to be okay with that? Uh, preparing uh, page nine in your book. So I'm going to ask you guys, and I'll send you an email to everyone um, that is participating. Actually, you send me, you guys are on the class. You're on the session. Print the guide out, and I want you to pull up page nine. And I want you to write down what you, how you would prepare and handle that situation. That is your homework for today. 
because I want to work with you guys one-on-one -on, -one on how you would handle it. And if you want some feedback and we can get into a two-way communication and just kind of talk through some different options. So those of you that will send that in, uh, we're going to get free coaching, right? Let's just talk around that topic and anything else that you might have questions on. So it's page nine of your guide, page nine of your guide. It basically looks like this. It's the three P approach. Oh, I don't have my camera on. Yeah, I do. I still have my camera on. It's the three P approach. They're going to get you the the They're like yeah, up to here. Write down your clarifying questions. All right, I lost the open mic. Write down your clarifying questions and the ahas that you would get from that. I want you guys to do that one on your own because we only have an hour to get through the material, but that's actually kind of a hands-on piece that I would like to see you guys do. All right, uh, let me see here. Just a couple more things I wanted to make sure we covered. On the learn part, calling the other agent, getting them on the phone is the best thing you can do to learn about the other side of the transaction. Pay attention to how they're talking too, like if they're frustrated or whatever. I mean, if they're just talking, they're talking, you're not gonna pick up anything on the nonverbal clues, but if they're frustrated with some stuff or they're like, I just, I don't know, we could not justify the price. So now that means I found information that now if I can go provide three comps, my three comps that would justify the price, I can send that to them and say, I'm not sure if you consider these as an option in that price, right? Keep quiet. Being quiet is probably the best thing you can do. Once you ask a question, try not to get into a back and forth debate. Do not debate. Just the one who's the quietest that's listening and asking great questions is going to win for their client. And then just stay calm the whole time. Do not whatever happens in there. Don't let them get you upset. Like I just said that example at the very beginning of the class. All right, so on this one, on the learn stuff, if you got the buyer wants to close in 60 days, seller wants to close in 30 days. So that's what's important about the 30 days to you, Mr. Seller. And uh, on the next part here, the goal is to let them know why it's important, right? But remember, you're selling back to the other side why this is the best deal that they're going to get, you know? Um like a lot of times with a lot of these offers, if we get caught up in price and stuff and we get back, uh, we've got one market where it's mostly 135 to 150, right? We're at a 125 price and they're at 111. I will come back and say, you can't find another property for 125. There's nothing else out there on the market. It's all 135 to 150. So this one, I mean, has a little bit of work to do, but you're getting it for 125. So I'll just do stuff like that to see if we can get them to come up. And it does work. They'll call back. All right, I'll come up to one, 118. 118. Okay, well, let me take that back. Get that in writing. Get it signed. Let me take it back to my seller. Because if it's in writing, I can get it signed. If it's not in writing, it could be a verbal back and forth. So I don't do anything verbal. I get it in writing. In fact, I held out three extra days on an offer because the agent would not put it in writing. It was all verbal. And I said, my seller will consider that. I mean, like, they're okay with the terms that you've explained to me, but we can't make a decision on it or lock up the house until we get it in writing. Now, they're, legally, you can, verbal contracts can be contracts. Doesn't mean you have to let your client get locked up in a verbal contract, right? And if another written offer shows up and it's better and you've got a verbal acceptance, that could be a situation for your client as well. Now it seems like it's a gray area and that's all gonna be determined by a judge. Um, so one of the things I'll tell you on buyers, if they're asking for a lot of repairs, have them write out. It doesn't matter if you think it's a lot or not. It's like, I need to sell to the listing agent that these repairs you're asking for are the shortest amount, least amount of repairs the seller is gonna to have to do. I have to sell that on them. So I want you to write out those, those here's the list of repairs. I want you to write out the repairs and what you think it's going to cost. So we have a dollar amount to justify why our offer is what it is. Guys, I hope you heard that. That one thing alone, when, an off, when a buyer's offering too low because of repairs and I have them write it out with a dollar amount, the dollar amount never matches how low they're going on the offer. So now I can have that other conversation with them. So if you lose the house over $10,000, are you going to be okay with that? Right. If I submit this offer and another offer comes in and you lose the house over 10 grand, are you OK with that? They're not going to be OK with it. They'll raise their price up 
to a more realistic thing. And you get the list of the repairs with the cost of it to present to the seller. Now, they may not agree with the costs that are on there, but also your buyer can't get too ridiculous because it's going to look stupid on a piece of paper and you got to present it to them. So it just puts everybody in, in a negotiable state or like a state to get it done. Um, agents, uh, if your buyers are coming in low on price and you got to call the listing agent, I have flat out asked. I'm like, I'm just having trouble coming up with the comps. I'm getting my buyer to make the best offer I can get them to make on what the property is worth. Do you have any comps to send over to me to support the price that you're at, right? So they'll, they'll send comps. Now they may send higher comps and I'm gonna still present them to my buyer. Maybe they'll raise the price up, maybe they won't. It's not my opinion, it's to ask questions and provide information and let them decide what it's worth to them. Um, this was a lot of information in here, guys. There's again, on page 12 of your participation guide, there's another little homework thing on there. You're a buyer, you got a scenario, you got a buyer role, a listing role. Print off page 12. Send me how you would handle that, right? And let's talk around how you would handle that and how I would handle it. In this particular case, um, I'm going to counter as least amount as possible. If they wanted appliances and furniture and all that stuff, I might just say to the seller, I know you were planning on giving those to your daughter, but if she could get all new appliances, what would that be worth? I don't know. We'd probably spend 2,500 bucks. Okay. So rather than counter the price higher, take out the appliances, change the closing date and do all that stuff. Let's just say that the new appliances for your daughter to get brand new is 2,500 bucks. Let's just counter the price to get the price where you want it. We'll tack on an extra 2,500 for the new, for the appliances and you could buy your daughter new appliances, right? I'm going to counter just the price and I'm going to ask more questions about the closing date and things like that. Could they live with that date, you know, and all that stuff, but you don't want them just to counter back five different things, roll it all, just ask questions. Why is that important to you? Try to get it down to just the price. I almost always just counter the price, right? Because then if they counter back a lower price, we can then start taking out closing costs or take out furniture or things like that. So we've dwindled it down. And then analyzing your counter tactics. So another thing on there was um, just going through uh, analyzing stuff ask for concessions, test the validity, find out if the problem is real. These are just the way you ask questions, the hot potato, the good guy, the bad guy. The notes I put on that, um, the nibbling one, you know, uh, usually we don't go back and forth. I tell the seller, we wanna just negotiate and counter back one time, make that the offer. And we usually don't go back. I don't usually go back three and four times nibbling, going back and forth. What I do is I've asked a lot of great questions. I know where their top dollar is according to the agent. I know where my bottom dollar is on the seller. Whatever counter comes back, I'm gonna convince the other side it's the best thing. On hot potato, um, on hot potato, it's only two to three dollars or three to four dollars more per thousand dollars. So anytime you're countering ten thousand dollars, it's really only 20 to 30 bucks. I always say around thirty dollars or so is all we're talking about here. You know, now for $10,000 in my market, they're getting quite a bit of concessions. And then the good guy, bad guy, you know, if you lose this property, are you okay? We've already covered a lot of this stuff, but as you're reading through the material again after the session, I want you to tag some of these things that we've said to what they are. So that's your hot potato. Any questions? I think that's it, guys. Um, just really on, as you guys leave the class and if you're out there doing the real world stuff, your common points, your, your three Ps, oh, yeah, there we go. Your three Ps are, are your common points of negotiation are prepare, present, and position. And you're usually negotiating price and terms. So do this stuff with live groups. Take the, the book that you have and get with a partner and go over some stuff. Get with your team leader, get with your productivity coach and go through some of these scenarios and tell them how you would handle it. Just play it off a whim, see if there's anything they can give you for feedback to make it better, and then do it again, right? You gotta practice this stuff. It's not, not gonna do anything for you sitting in this class. You wanna go back and in real life, go back and pull these up and watch them. So I, there was a lot of stuff in this one today. Um, how do you guys doing? You doing okay? Was it good stuff?
I've only got a couple videos on to see thumbs up or whatever, but yep, I see some thumbs up, thumbs up. All right. Anybody have any last questions, comments, questions, successes, or anything they want to share? All right, remember, I put a challenge out to you. You got a little bit of homework today to go through your action guide and do some of that, respond the way you would you think you would respond and send it to me. Let, let's get into a two-way conversation over some little tips and tricks on how you would tweak it. I'll be watching for them in my email, cornteamkc at gmail.com, or you can text them to me. If you fill the form out, just take a picture of it and text it to me. Got my cell phone as well. Have a great day, guys. Go out there and sell. Add your five a day. Five today. Thanks, five today. Yes. Thanks. You betcha. Thanks so much.